Hello and welcome back to another video about the units of Company of Heroes 2 in which I will talk about the historical background of the units in the game and I will uh, tell you something about what's historically accurate about the units and what isn't and, and this is the last video in the series I have done all factions up to now and um, the previous video was about the infantry of the United Kingdom forces, the UKF. So today it's the turn for the vehicles of uh, UKF faction. Uh, so without further ado, let's start in the base with the lightest vehicle of all, the Universal Carrier. Gear and ready to go. The Universal Carrier is uh, a very small vehicle, as you can see. It's uh, actually uh, a vehicle that was produced uh, before the war. When the war broke out, uh, it uh, turned out to be <laughs> very useful. Um, and it has a crew of three. You can see two here, but uh, in reality there's uh, three guys driving this little carrier. Uh, when it was designed, it was in the 1930s, it was actually produced by a, um, a, a, a factory called Vickers Armstrongs and they were, uh, they were produ producing it for the commercial market and they maybe they didn't know yet that it was going to be used in the, uh, by the army to great extent. Over uh, 113,000 of these were built and in the beginning there were various types of uh, carriers. The main uh, uh, feature of the design of the carrier is that it's divided in two parts uh, in the back where you can see uh, the Lee Enfields are uh, stacked in racks and uh, here the passengers could sit and they would face each other. So uh, they would sit on benches and look at each other while driving. In the front there was a driver and there was a compartment for the gunner in the very very first uh, uh, carrier uh, variations there was not a gun installed but uh, uh, and those were called uh, scout carriers but um, the, uh, the, the most uh, common one was the Bren carrier as you can see here it's, uh, it has a Bren gun installed for the gunner the vehicle was widely used by uh, the all British Commonwealth forces and uh, they were also used for uh, art uh, as an artillery tractor but they were most used for uh, transporting personnel and equipment and sometimes as the machine gun platform so uh, they would drive up to a location and suppress the enemy by firing the machine gun and this uh, will would have been um, uh, with the Bren gun mostly. There were also some variations that uh, uh, pretty soon got uh, the, uh, the, the name machine gun carrier and they were outfitted with the Vickers K mounted uh, on the vehicle. Uh, when you upgrade it in uh, Company of Heroes 2 you will uh, notice that it's uh, uh, on the side here and as uh, actually there were also uh, variations of the brand carrier with uh, weaponry in the back in the center on the center piece there could be a uh, Vickers water-cooled machine gun like the one that I discussed in the infantry video and there were also uh, carriers that were uh, carrying a um, boys uh, anti-tank rifle instead of the Bren in the front. So uh, here you can see the third crew member actually because he's the secondary gunner um, and this is of course uh, an up-armored version. The Universal Carrier was uh, derived from a tankette family which was uh, produced in the 1920s and uh, you can see that by the fact that it doesn't have a normal road wheels. It's a fully tracked vehicle so it was also uh, meant to have the front wheels um, turning sharply uh, 
when the steering wheel would be used and as you can see here this the driver has the steering wheel firmly in his hands and he could uh, turn one wheel and break the other and then uh, make pretty sharp turns with this uh, nice carrier. The theory and policy of the carrier was that it was a firepower transport and the crew would dismount to fight but in practice it was also carrying machine guns like you can see here and also sometimes mortars and uh, uh, or artillery and observation equipment and when it had a mortar um, then it could be a mobile mortar platform like it could be a mobile machine gun platform. Um, the universal carriers were issued to the support companies in infantry rifle battalions and they had up to 33 per battalion by 1943. Um, later in the war there were uh, some special uh, carrier platoons and a British carrier platoon originally had 10 universal carriers with three carrier sections of three universal carriers each plus another universal carrier in the platoon headquarters. So that would be an army consisting, a little army consisting of uh, carriers alone. Uh, later the crew uh, uh, was uh, changed and then um, apart from a, uh, an NCO and a, a rifleman, there would also be a, an extra mechanic and, uh, and the universal carrier in each section was commanded by a sergeant and uh, the other two would be commanded by corporals. So, uh, this uh, carrier was uh, uh, one of the most common vehicles of the British Army in World War II and after the war they were also sold to various other countries. So this, uh, is, this concludes the part about the universal carrier. Let's go to the armored car now, which is here. It's called the AEC Mark III 75 mm armored car. Um, like the carrier, this one also has the Achilles uh, uh, graffiti uh, on the side. I'm not sure why that is, because uh, like I discussed uh, in the previous uh, video, Achilles was the name for the M10 conversion, the British M10 conversion carrying a 17 pounder. And uh, the actual Achilles is not in the game. Um, the armored car was um, uh, is called AEC as you can see and the AEC is uh, an abbreviation for Associated Equipment Company uh, which was manufacturing these cars. 629 of these were built which is uh, much 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 fewer than uh, the Universal Carriers of course so this was a pretty rare vehicle and um, the uh, manufacturing of this vehicle stemmed from a, a um, of a manufacturer that was making an artillery tractor and when it was on a uh, parade in London uh, Winston Churchill had a very good impression of this thing and then they were uh, being produced in 1942 and 1943 uh, but then they ceased production I think that's because the up-armored uh, German tanks uh, were taking over the majority of the vehicles on the field and light vehicles like scout cars were getting rarer and rarer. So building scout cars yourself was also a bit obsolete. Um, there was uh, the first uh, version carried a two-pounder gun and uh, then uh, other versions uh, received a six pounder or a 75 millimeter gun. You can see this one uh, is in the latter category. The machine gun, uh, which is here, is the BESA machine gun, which is the machine gun which is as used in most British vehicles as coaxial machine guns in turrets of um, uh, fighting vehicles. The Mark I was used in combat in North African campaign late in 1942 for the first time and uh, they were uh, assumedly fitted with, uh, some of them were assumedly fitted with a Crusader tank turret uh, 
uh, so they could carry the six pounder gun. The Mark II and the Mark III took part in fighting in Europe with British uh, units, often together with the Staghound, which is a uh, an, uh, a bigger scout car than the AEC. And the Mark III was officially called the Close Support Armored Car, and it had the quick firing 75 millimeter as main armament. So. Uh, this concludes the part about the armored car. Let's Vehicle go to the to half track. This is an M3 half track, and the M3 half track is uh, not a British design. As you might have noticed by now, is that all uh, vehicles starting with an M are from the United States. So uh, this one is also uh, from the United States. It, uh, the development of this half-track began uh, 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 with the conversion of M3 scout cars into half-tracks. So uh, the M3 was already produced by the White Motor Company, of course, and then uh, this company also helped to convert the scout car into a half-track. Uh, the half-track was carrying a uh, M2 Browning machine gun, which you can see here, and uh, there were um, th most of these uh, that were built were uh, uh, sent uh, in land lease uh, in land lease contracts to the Soviet Union and to the United Kingdom. They were produced in 1941, and over 53,000 of these were built, including all of Orion's. So uh, there were um, uh, there were many many uh, modifications of the M3, uh, of which you don't see any in game because the the game uh, only shows this one. This is the regular half track, uh, which uh, you can see here. It, uh, it has uh, front road wheels, and in the back the the tracks. Uh, they were pretty unpopular with the Americans. They were initially called Purple Heart Boxes because uh, y you could die so easily uh, when uh, driving inside them. Uh, but the um, Americans knew that uh, this unpopularity stemmed from the crew uh, not being experienced enough to uh, limit the use of the half-track to its intended purposes. And they were trying to do too, ma uh, too many different things with them. Um, the Allied nations uh, uh, were getting these from the United States and uh, after the M3 and the M5 was put into production and I have already talked about that when I was doing the video about the United States forces. So I'll uh, leave it here for the M3 half-track. Um, it is looking pretty similar to the M3 Scout car except for the uh, the single browning on a ring so that you could uh, the, the gunner could turn the gun around uh, 360 degrees and um, that's it for the light vehicles of the United Kingdom forces. So let's go to the next two tanks because there's two tanks. There's this one and there's this one and actually they share a story because the Cromwell and the Centaur they were produced in uh, the same uh, period of time and actually the production of these tanks is kind of similar to a soap opera for which no TV station uh, would have a lack of interest these days. The um, Cromwell tank is uh, the, the end product of a large production line in cruiser tanks. The British tanks uh, uh, were divided into two uh, kinds of tanks. There were the infantry tanks. They were supposed to be slow because they had to accompany infantry. And the cruiser tanks were fast. They were supposed to uh, go ahead of the infantry, uh, scout out territory, uh, maybe uh, kill some or, or destroy some light vehicles of the enemy and uh, that would be it. 
Uh, the infantry tanks, on the other hand, they would be slow, so the infantry uh, could keep up with them while walking. And the infantry tanks were also more heavily armed, as in not armed but armored. As in they would have thicker armor plates around the hull and the turret. Uh, this one is named after Oliver Cromwell, uh, who was the English Civil War leader, the uh, single Lord Protector of the United Kingdom in the 17th century. The that doesn't have a uh, very specific reason that it was named after this guy, because uh, all cruiser tanks were supposed to have a name that started with a C. So, uh, Centaur, uh, Cromwell, uh, Cruiser, the, the earliest cruisers were just called cruisers, Crusader, um, Cavalier, and after the war they continued with uh, producing the Centurion, which is a quite famous tank. The Cromwell, uh, the most the most well-known feature of the Cromwell is its speed and um, that's uh, also something that you can use in game. It has been in service uh, from 1944 and uh, there were a uh, little over 4,000 were built. The crew uh, has a commander and you can upgrade the Cromwell with a commander uh, so that it's uh, it can see a bit further on the battlefield and it can direct the driver who is here and uh, there's uh, the hull gunner uh, it's also a BESA machine gun and there's the coaxial machine gun in the turret and uh, there's the 75 millimeter uh, quick firing 75 meter ordnance gun as the main weapon. Um, the Cromwell would carry 64 rounds into battle and uh, the uh, Cromwell uh, soap operas uh, in, the, in the production is that actually there were three tanks which were uh, about to uh, be produced, the Cavalier, the Centaur and the uh, uh, Cromwell. The Cavalier never really made it, it was only used for training purposes and the main difference between the Centaur and the Cromwell was that the Centaur was sporting the Liberty engine which had 340 horsepower and the Cromwell was uh, being equipped with the uh, Meteor engine which had 600 horsepower. This also explained uh, the difference in the speed of both tanks. Most um, famous is uh, the Cromwell uh, are the Cromwell tanks that were in the uh, Guards Armored Division. Uh, they had uh, reconnaissance uh, tasks in the Royal Armored Corps and uh, they were also being put in the 7th and the 11th Armored Divisions fighting in Normandy and in Northwestern Europe from June 1944 till the end of the war. The 7th Armored Division had uh, uh, Cromwells only, while the other two divisions that I just mentioned had a mix of Cromwells and Shermans. While the production was um, being initiated, they wanted a uh, they wanted a successor to the Crusader tank. The Crusader was uh, in use in the North African campaign, and uh, the it was quite successful, but it could only carry a six-pounder gun. So uh, when they were uh, uh, doing the, the war uh, ministry and the government of uh, England, or Great Britain, they wanted to uh, have uh, different companies produce tanks and uh, put in tank designs so that they could pick the best one a practice which was pretty uh, pretty much uh, used in all countries during the war and uh, Nazi Germany was uh, no uh, was uh, pretty infamous for it that they were trying to have um, they were trying to make competition between uh, companies to get the best results but also in the Allied nations this was a very w well known practice so uh, there were different uh, uh, designs submitted 
uh, with the Liberty engine and with the Meteor engine and uh, when they were examined the one with the Meteor engine uh, came out as the winner so they decided to start uh, with the production but in um, when the war actually uh, was uh, breaking out because this was all taking place uh, in 1940 and 1941 and uh, when the, bro uh, the war broke out um, uh, for the British forces not only in North Africa but also in, uh, in uh, North uh, Western Europe then they had a, a problem because uh, Rolls-Royce uh, was producing the Meteor engine and they had a problem because um, they had uh, 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 they, uh, they, they, start, they stopped their car production and they set up a design team looking for other ways to use their design capability. So uh, when they uh, finally came up with uh, the a new engine, at first they made the Merlin engine and uh, that was used for example in the Spitfire plane and uh, then they would uh, also uh, make a new engine for the tanks uh, which was the uh, Meteor. Uh, this one had uh, doubled the horsepower of the previous uh, uh, designed engines which was a uh, which was of course an advantage so that the tank could uh, be more powerful and uh, m uh, faster on the battlefield for example. The there was a, a cooling problem with the uh, with the engine. So in mid 1941, they had to change the design of the uh, of the engine, and uh, then there was also some uh, um, there was uh, between the different production plants of the engines and uh, other parts of the Cromwell. There was a little fight going on. Uh, the competition became a bit sharp and then they were uh, stealing each other's ideas a bit and uh, finally this uh, caused a lot of um, delay in the production of this tank so uh, while they were uh, d while they were bickering among each other uh, they were um, they were having trouble to put out production and uh, that meant that the uh, uh, the war needed uh, machines so the english were dying to get uh, new tanks on the field. So uh, there uh, they had uh, Shermans in the land lease uh, contract with the United States. They were getting the Shermans but the um, and the Shermans also had the dual purpose 70 millimeter gun so they could fire AP shells and high explosive shells which was better than the six pounder who could only fire uh, AP shells at the time. So um, they uh, they had a they had trouble uh, producing the Cromwell and uh, these engine uh, troubles and the uh, discussion about which gun to put on the turret um, meant that uh, the production of the Cromwell was almost cancelled because uh, the Soviet forces rejected the Sherman tank that was to be provided through the third protocol of land lease and this led to a surplus in Sherman tank manufacturing capacity and significant pressure was placed for the Cromwell program to be cancelled in favor of US produced Shermans otherwise there would be a lot of Sherman uh, tank uh, assembly lines closing and in America that would mean a lot of unemployment and uh, with the uh, economic crisis of the 1930s in the back of their heads the American officials didn't think that was a very good idea uh, British forces however didn't want to uh, move completely over to uh, uh, US produced Shermans because that would mean they would be super dependent on the transport of US vehicles to Great Britain and uh, they had a strategic uh, uh, argument to say that uh, they should also have uh, home produced uh, vehicles like the Cromwell so uh, fortunately for the Cromwell this was uh, uh, th the decision was made to do a reduction in British tank production during 1943 and 1944 uh, as a compromise 
uh, they increase the consumption of German Sherman tanks and uh, the that meant the Centaur production actually stopped and uh, the, uh, the parts that were already finished they could uh, just assemble them together and so you got a bit of hybrid vehicle between a Cromwell and a Centaur like a uh, uh, Centaur hull with uh, Cromwell engine and turret uh, for example uh, came onto the field. So the, um, uh, the Cromwell was uh, the, the like I said the, the most important uh, property of the uh, for the uh, Cromwell was its speed and uh, the speed was uh, 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 could be super useful uh, uh, to, to use against the, the stronger German tanks because the stronger German tanks could take out a Cromwell pretty easily. But if the Cromwell was in an ambush position uh, then it could shoot the tracks or uh, uh, at the, tu the turret ring of the Panther and the Tiger and then it could uh, do some damage or uh, jam the turret of the uh, German tank. Um, so, the Cromwell was actually the fastest British tank to serve in the Second World War and its top speed was, was uh, 64 kilometers an hour which equals uh, 40 miles per hour and uh, they, could, uh, they could hit and run uh, because of this speed because they would uh, drive up, shoot the tank and then uh, uh, just uh, speed away from uh, any danger so the German tanks could not fire back easily. The Sherman could also circle uh, enemy tanks but that was uh, sometimes you see uh, players do that in game but in reality that was pretty dangerous because the, uh, an, a German tank would almost never be alone and that would mean that the Cromwell would uh, expose one of his sides or the backside to a second or a third German tank. The best uh, part about the Cromwell, apart from its speed, is uh, the uh, was the low profile. Uh, so it was used as a reconnaissance tank and uh, it was also a very re reliable tank. Uh, it ne almost never broke down. It wasn't as sturdy as, the m as most Germans, but it was a lot better in uh, not breaking down than uh, the, sur uh, the Centaurs and the Cavaliers. Um, there's, uh, there's this little anecdote about uh, the Cromwell speed in that it was fighting in the Low Countries and uh, while they had to cross a canal, it was a 20 feet wide canal, uh, they just uh, sped up their tanks and then they jumped the canal, um, totally uh, uh, surprising the German defenders, of course. So, uh, the uh, Mark IV is uh, one of the later variants of the Cromwell, because, of course, if you have a Mark IV, then there were also uh, Mark I's, Mark II and Mark III Cromwells, and the Mark IV had the the 75 millimeter gun, uh, which uh, was um, actually a development from the six pounder, because they would just bore out the uh, the barrels of the six pounders, so they could uh, fire the 75 millimeter high explosive shells produced by the Americans, and then they would not have to uh, alter that uh, ammunition. So that was a big advantage uh, for. Um for the British. The, uh, this was the, uh, the later Cromwell force, uh, saw the introduction of the final specification uh, and that was the, uh, this is the most numerous variant uh, with almost 2000 uh, produced. Then let's have a quick look at the Centaur because uh, this is the same hull. Uh, I guess that the developers of the game uh, the didn't really uh, make the differences between uh, the models but this is the AA uh, variant of the Centaur and it's uh, sporting an AA gun which is called the Polston uh, it's actually an, um, an uh, it's a, a, a Polish design 
Let's uh, have it attacking this enemy. So you can see that it's a quick firing AA gun. And uh, Polston is a, a very weird name. Nobody is really sure what it stands for. Um, uh, the most probable uh, explanation is that it's a compound based on Poland on one hand and a Royal Small Arms Factory Enfield uh, on the other one. So uh, the uh, Small Arms Factory was uh, Shepherd, Turpin and Enfield which makes up Sten and then Poland, Pol uh, together is Pol Sten but uh, it's not uh it's not 100% sure that this is true, so if you know uh, where the name Polston stems from, then uh, please post in the comments. Let's go to the next tank. Sherman Firefly ready. This is the Sherman Firefly, and the Sherman Firefly is a Sherman, of course. The Shermans, I've discussed the Shermans uh, in the video of the United States forces already. So I'm not uh, going into the production of the Sherman and uh, what it all, uh, uh, what that all meant. But the Firefly uh, was a special Sherman, of course, and uh, that's the because of the fact that it was carrying a 17-pounder gun. And uh, more about that later. It was designed in 1943 and uh, a little over 2000 of these were built so it was uh, pretty common, uh, no it was not really common but it was more common than uh, at least uh, than the Centaur uh, AA uh, tank that I just discussed because that was pretty rare and uh, this uh, 17 pounder gun uh, was uh, uh, fitted on tanks. Uh, the, the in the British Army they were uh, using Shermans already in the North African campaign and there they renamed their Sherman uh, from M4 to uh, a number. So uh, in North Africa they used the Sherman 2 and by the time of the invasion of Normandy they were using Sherman 5s. Uh, all these Shermans had 75 millimeter guns and um, as you might already know, uh, especially if you have seen previous videos, uh, that was uh, very good against uh, fortified positions, uh, against infantry uh, blobs, ha, <laughs> blobs, uh, and against bunkers and stuff, uh, but not against tanks. So uh, the tanks, um, uh, the British were in need for um, a, a heavy tank destroyer. Uh, so they were trying to experiment by putting 17-pounder guns on uh, on different chassis. They had already tried to do that on the Cromwell chassis, as but the the turret ring of the Cromwell was too uh, tight. It wasn't wide enough to uh, to have the 17-pounder gun uh, fitted in and uh, being able to reload it in battle. So uh, they were. Uh, uh they were experimenting with different designs and uh, then they, um, they, they uh, ended up by uh, trying to do it uh, with the, uh, the, the, the Sherman. So the Sherman uh, had, to be, uh, had to be modified so that the 17 pounder could fit in and uh, some things were altered about the 17 pounder uh, itself it was actually a top-loaded gun and it had to be altered so it could be a side-loaded gun and uh, there were some uh, modifications to the turret of the Firefly as well because it was a very heavy gun and very long as you can see it really sticks out uh, they had to put a counterweight in the back of the turret which was also used to uh, store the radio because the radio was actually inside the turret but uh, because of the new loading system from the left, the radio had to move, so they, uh, they caught two birds with one stone there. The long, ba the long barrel uh, was, um, uh, was uh, uh, needed to have the high velocity 17-pounder uh, uh, shells leaving the, uh, the, the barrel uh, with enough speed to get uh, the penetration needed for the enemy tanks. 
and um, this uh, long barrel meant that the uh, German tankers were instructed to uh, to kill fireflies first. So this meant that uh, the crews of the fireflies were trying to camouflage their long barrels and uh, make it look like they were actually uh, regular 75 millimeter Shermans. So they would paint this part of the barrel white or white with green uh, stripes or uh, with a, a wavy pattern uh, to make it look like it was uh, a, a regular short barreled Sherman so they would not be targeted immediately in an engagement. Um, when the gun fired the flash of the uh, of the, the muzzle flash of the barrel was so bright that the crew had to close their eyes and if they wouldn't do that they would be blinded for a bit. So uh, it was very important for everyone to uh, when the uh, gunner would uh, shout fire in the wireless communication then uh, everybody would close their eyes for a few seconds so that they could uh, 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 keep their sight and uh, not get blinded. Uh, this bright muzzle flash was also uh, adopted due uh, the no, the this bright muzzle flash also meant that the nickname Firefly was uh, uh, put on this tank. Uh, some other units, uh, because it was not an official name, some other units also called it the Mayfly um, and uh, that was because of this brightness and uh, the uh, that's actually a pretty uh, funny uh, detail about this tank. The Firefly was able to penetrate the heaviest German tanks like the Tiger and the Panther and uh, to do that they uh, had uh, several uh, p uh, uh, types of ammunition. The best one was armor piercing discarding Sabbat APDS but that was pretty rare so they uh, mostly used armor piercing capped ballistic capped APCBC ammunition uh, and uh, uh, with APCBC uh, they had to get a bit closer to get uh, uh, um, a secure penetration of the enemy tank. Only in late 1944 there was a good high explosive shell for the gun available and until that time uh, they were purely used as anti-tank uh, vehicles which could not be used against soft targets and that's why um, when this uh, came into service uh, some British units were ordered to replace all their Shermans and uh, get these ones but they didn't want that because uh, then they would not be able to kill soft targets anymore and especially with uh, infantry carried AT weaponry which became a lot more common in the later years of the war they wanted to have uh, high explosive shells uh, readily available. The Firefly uh, therefore was uh, not on the front lines in every fight, it was actually a bit more in the back and that's also how it's used in game uh, very often where other uh, units are uh, spotting for the Firefly and uh, then the Firefly itself will uh, fire its uh, gun into the German Panther or Tiger or lighter tank. The Yeah, the Firefly uh, was uh, actually only used as a stopgap solution for uh, before the British could be uh, able to uh, produce uh, their own 70-pounder tank. And um, even though it was just a, a stopgap, uh, it was the most common vehicle carrying a 17-pounder in the Second World War. Okay, before we move to the next tank, I'm uh, going to show you the Tulip Rockets, which were actually realistic, because uh, the Tulip Rockets were uh, fitted onto the tank with this type of rack, and um, the Tulip Rockets were uh, meant to, uh, ac to uh, stun the crew of an enemy tank. So that was that's also portrayed in game uh, where you can see that if you hit an enemy tank uh, 
it's actually uh, the, that the crew is blinded for a bit and you get this yellow uh, yellow sign thingy that it's um, uh, it, uh, with the, the, the lightning flash so uh, one of these rockets on each side and uh, when you fire them it uh, I, don't I don't know if I can show it without an enemy vehicle Firing yes I can and then they are into the enemy tank Okay, let's move on to the next tank, which is the Comet, and this is actually the real successor of the Cromwell. Um, as you can see, the turret looks pretty much the same, and uh, I mean the hull looks pretty much the same, and the biggest difference, come over here, Comet, please. The biggest difference is the gun, because this is the uh, the 17 pounder. Uh, carrying tank that was uh, meant to be uh, in the British Army. The Comet tank was also a cruiser and therefore it has a name that starts with a C and uh, this had the new 77 mm HV gun uh, which could also uh, penetrate the Panther and the Tiger at medium ranges. Most people think that this is the best British tank of the war it started production uh, in 1944 and um, in December 1944 it uh, was in action for the first time and it was mostly used in the last months of the war and uh, then it was used uh, after World War II for quite some times time by different countries. Um, a little over now almost 1200 were built which is a lot less than the stopgap solution that I just discussed uh, in the uh, form of the Firefly. And uh, the this is the heaviest cruiser tank that the British produced in World War II. The firepower f uh, to uh, penetrate Panthers and Shermans was uh, needed, so therefore they were uh, starting to, uh, to uh, produce this uh, Comet and uh, they in uh, by producing the comment they wanted to correct some of the Cromwell's flaws in armament track design and suspension so they um, they uh, they uh, looked into the documents that they had used by uh, creating the Cromwell and then they changed up some stuff so it became the comet actually the uh, the gun was not a uh, uh the same gun as on the Firefly because it was a shortened barrel and this made it possible to mount the gun on a smaller turret ring and uh, therefore it could be used on the hulls that were produced in the time of the production of the Cromwell. So the, uh, the Comet was uh, mostly used in the Ardennes offensive and uh, they um, uh, they were uh, supposed to be used in the Ardennes offensive, but uh, when they uh, the British um, brigades were ordered to go to Brussels to switch the Shermans to Comets, the Ardennes offensive broke out, and then they uh, had to uh, rush back to the scene, and therefore they didn't have time to complete the switch, and they fought the uh, Germans mostly with Shermans in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, later they were used in the crossing of the Rhine and had a, a little part in finishing the war in 1945. So let's go to the next tank. Infantry tank ready to go. It already tells you that it's an infantry tank. And uh, this is an example of the other type of tank that I discussed. There were uh, cruiser tanks and infantry tanks and this is the example of the infantry tank. The Churchill was uh, an infantry tank already produced in the time of World War I. Uh, at least the, the ideas for producing the Churchill were already there. And um, the design was uh, uh, developed over time and uh, they actually started production only when the Second World War had already broken out. Uh, about 5,600 were built uh, 
and uh, this was a very slow uh, tank and uh, you know why that is because it had uh, to the infantry had to be able to keep up with the Churchill the Churchill has uh, several features that were uh, that are in game also. Uh, it has a 75 millimeter uh, main gun. It has a, a coaxial and a hull machine gun, and it has a, uh, a, a bomb throw mechanism, which was also present on the Comet, by the way, and also on some other tanks. The Cromwell also had it in the later variants, but the Cromwell doesn't have it in-game. But the uh, Churchill does have it, and it works something like this. You can see way. that the the hatch is opening, the commander hatch, and uh, somebody is uh, throwing out a grenade. And uh, this is a bit uh, uh, provisional, because... Uh, Actually, there uh, were some uh, mechanisms to make it uh, being thrown uh, so that you wouldn't be exposed. Uh, the production, uh, the, the idea for this tank came from World War I, where the tanks had difficulties to cross uh, uh, muddy grounds of uh, Flanders with all those trenches. So uh, the ability to cross difficult ground was really... Um, the main part of uh, getting the Churchill into production. The Churchill uh, was used by the British and Commonwealth forces in the North Africa campaign, in Italy and in Northwest Europe, and a few hundred were supplied to the Soviet Union under the land lease uh, contracts. The name of the Churchill tank is a bit weird because uh, you would think that Churchill, well, um, uh, England, Churchill, Winston Churchill, and uh, actually if you look it up, uh, some uh, uh, sources will tell you that it's actually named after Winston Churchill, uh, based on some of his sayings about, uh, well, they named the tank after me because we have a similar weight. Uh, but. Uh, if you uh, know Winston Churchill a little bit from other sources, then you might know that he was a very ironical man who was uh, making a lot of uh, jokes about himself, and uh, therefore this is not really proof that um, that the name uh, was um, given because of him, uh, Winston Churchill himself. Um, other people state that, uh, that uh, it was named after the Churchill family and uh, there are uh, uh, maybe it's an, uh, not named after Winston Churchill but uh, after one of his ancestors uh, which was called uh, John Churchill he was the Lord of Marlborough and uh, the, uh, the that's more probable because uh, the uh, the name giving in England was uh, always about people who had been dead for a while. So they would not name a tank which was in service at that time after a living person, let alone after the person who was leaving the country at that time. Because even though he was pretty popular, there were also uh, people that resented Winston Churchill for putting everything in the economy on the waging of the war and also um, he was quite controversial in using the army to break strikes and therefore a tank naming after a controversial prime minister was not the best idea because maybe the guys who were producing the tank at Vauxhall Manufacturing would not want to produce a tank named after a guy that was putting the military in their factory halls in order to put them under pressure to stay uh, at work so most likely it's uh, it's named after an ancestor of Winston Churchill and not after himself and uh, so this uh, but it's it's still not entirely sure if that's the case but uh, seeing the uh, the name giving conventions in England it's highly unlikely that they uh, would choose uh, someone that was still alive by the time that the name was given and the vehicle was being produced. Okay, the Churchill tank had various uh, variations. 
it was uh, like I said it was very slow but it had also had a lot of armor armor so uh, it uh, th a very thick frontal armor and uh, the uh, Churchill tank uh, was uh, being used in uh, uh, in almost all theaters of war uh, the poor speed of the Churchill nearly caused production to be seized in favor of the Cromwell and uh, actually it was uh, the Churchill was saved by uh, the successful use of the Churchill Mark III in uh, the Battle of El Alamein in October 1942. Uh, in 1942 uh, the Churchill was also used at the ill-fated Dieppe raid where the Canadians were practicing for the invasion of France and failing horribly uh, losing all tanks that were put ashore uh, and actually most tanks didn't even reach the shore uh, later the the variants were being developed even further and in um, the mark 7 the mark 7 was uh, is the is the one that you can see in game and and uh, that was uh, the 1600 of those were produced so it's the it was the second major redesign from previous models and uh, the 70 millimeter gun was new uh, it carried much more armor 50% thicker at the front than a Tiger 1 so it could be punished heavily without uh, uh, being breached sometimes people call this the heavy Churchill and um, it uh, first saw service in the Battle of Normandy. Uh, it served with three Royal Armored Corps, and uh, also uh, that was in Normandy, and uh, with one in Italy. Uh, this infantry tank uh, also had uh, some variations. The Mark VII was uh, modified Tiger. to uh, have a flamethrower fit in front instead of one of the coaxial machine guns. So uh, let's see what that looks like. So the main gun is firing and the flamethrower is firing. And these crocodiles, they were they were pretty famous and uh, like the uh, universal carrier which could also be uh, equipped with uh, a flamethrower let's uh, equip one with a flamethrower right now universal carrier ready for the off. oh I can't do that I have to make a platoon command post Com first command post is finished and ready for use so, uh, an upgrade fitted and working. Carrier ready to steady then. This is the wasp. Target under fire. And uh, both the wasp and the crocodile were uh, famous for being terror weapons against the Germans. And there are some stories that Germans would flee their positions when they would see a crocodile approaching not sure if this is an anecdote or based on true stories but at least uh, it's uh, quite uh, quite noticeable that this Churchill had um, had uh, some uh, saw some service and uh, was being used uh, against infantry of course then there was also this other version of the Churchill which there we can we see here this is the Avre, which means Armored Vehicle Royal Engineers and it was an engineering vehicle um, because after the Dieppe raid the British had seen that it was uh, uh, very important to uh, blow up obstacles so they designed this one and it has the, the spigot uh, mortar also called the Petard and uh, that the, f the fact that it has a an English and a French name is uh, probably because of its Canadian origin because the um, Churchills uh, at Dieppe were used by Canadian uh, troops uh, so uh, the, uh, the Petard was a, a very uh, heavy uh, spigot mortar it uh, throws an 18 kilograms bomb demolition number one and it's all that has the nickname the flying dustbin and this looks something like this 
feel sorry for the poor buggers. Very large explosion. And uh, this means that... One demolition job coming up. Motor firing. Boom. So it's a bit similar to the explosion of the Sturm Tiger. And, uh, the, well, even uh, the sturdiest bunkers would uh, crack under the high explosive power of the petard. Uh, it had to be uh, reloaded uh, with uh, several people and uh, even one would have to get out of the tank to uh, speed up the reloading process and um, then and you had to, re uh, do to rotate the turret in uh, uh, several different positions in order to make it um, uh, able to be uh, reloaded. So uh, reload took a lot of uh, time and uh, the, uh, the in the invasion of France uh, there were about 180 uh, Avres uh, converted Churchills and they were first deployed in Normandy by the 79th Armored Division on D-Day. Uh, 574 more Avres were produced after D-Day and uh, the uh, Royal Engineers uh, would drive most of the uh, would be uh, uh, the 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 crew consist mostly of royal engineers, except uh, usually from the driver. The driver would be from the Royal Armored Corps. One of the royal engineers would be a demolitions NCO sapper, uh, and he would be responsible for priming the flying dustbin, and he would also lead the crew when they dismounted from the tank to place demolition charges. The Avres were part of uh, Hobart's Funnies and uh, most Hobart's Funnies actually were variations of the Churchill. So the Churchill uh, served in uh, on D-Day in, uh, in many, many uh, variations that were never used again after D-Day anymore. Uh, Hobart's Funnies uh, uh, became famous because uh, the Major General Percy Hobart uh, they um, uh, were uh, he designed uh, several weird uh, forms of tanks that uh, helped the allies to win D-Day. Okay, on to the next tank. This is the Valentine, and the Valentine is uh, a tank that had been produced by the British Army from the start of the war, and uh, the Valentine. Uh, was in service from 1940 to uh, long after the war. It was designed in 1938. Over 8,000 of those were built. And uh, it was being produced until the end of the war in uh, various marks. Uh, as you can see, this is the Mark 11. And the, mark, uh, the first marks were uh, heavier tanks. Uh, they were some sort of a infantry tank uh, but also with some cruiser properties and they uh, they were fighting in North Africa mostly but the uh, later in the war the uh, the uh, the newer marks they were used like this one the mark 11 uh, it was uh, used by the Royal Artillery as an OP command tank uh, until the end of the war and this is also of course the function that it has in Company of Heroes 2. It has the uh, ability to call in artillery barrages as uh, because this uh, command tank uh, was um, designed to scout out positions that could then be uh, bombarded with artillery. This was the, uh, the last uh, variation of the Valentine and um, it was faster than the previous uh, variations of the Valentine, uh, which was about as slow as most infantry tanks in the uh, desert campaign in North Africa in the beginning of the war. And um, in the end of the war, the Valentine was uh, carrying the same 75 millimeter gun as the, uh, the Cromwell was, so it could fight a bit uh, for itself. Uh, but mostly it was used as a uh, as a uh, observing tank, uh, a scouting unit, uh, which could then be used in conjunction with uh, the 
artillery, which we have here. This is the Sexton self-propelled artillery. And uh, it has a 25-pounder gun. And, and I already talked about the 25-pounder gun in the previous video. So uh, you know that it was uh, used in direct fire rolls and also in indirect fire howitzer rolls. And uh, the Sexton was um, being designed in 1942. It was in service from 1943 uh, till uh, way after the war. It was the production ceased in the last year of the war and over 2000 were built by then. Uh, the uh, British Army wanted to have uh, better uh, uh, mobile artillery support. So in 1942 they, uh, they put a different turret on the Valentine that I was just discussing before and uh, uh, mounted a howitzer inside it. This became the Bishop. But the bishop had many problems in service and uh, the gunners uh, uh, needed to put the bishop on ramps because the gun could not be elevated high enough to get the range that they wanted. So the bishop was uh, replaced by the priest and the priest was uh, an American built vehicle and um, because the priest used the American 105mm howitzer rather than the British 25-pounder uh, uh, howitzer, they had uh, to use different ammunition, which was uh, very complicated and not really uh, useful for the British. So uh, they wanted their own, um, they wanted their own self-propelled gun, and actually this was uh, mostly produced or designed in uh, Canada. And uh, the prototype was shipped to the UK in 1943 and uh, when they were satisfied about it, they des uh, designated this it as the Sexton. And uh, you might not know this, but a Sexton is also a religious function. We had the Bishop, which was given that nickname because it resembled uh, a Bishop's mitre, the, the turret resembled the mitre. And then we had, we had the priest because of a certain ring on top of the self-propelled gun there which resembled the priest's collar. And uh, then they, in that tradition they went on and called this one the sexton. And the sexton is the guy who is, um, who is uh, doing the, um, the maintenance on the church building and uh, the graveyard. So uh, that's why uh, this was uh, called the, the Sexton. Uh, apart from these, there was a, a six-pounder gun on a truck, which was called the Deacon, also a religious function. Okay, let's have the Sexton fire at this bunker for a while. So that you can see what it looks like when it fires very strong loaders because he uh, picks up the shell like it's nothing and uh, this concludes our part about the uh, land vehicles of the uh, British Army. Hey, this leaves the planes because there's a few commander abilities uh, with planes. I'm not talking about air supremacy because air supremacy has um, uh, one model which I will discuss uh, in the strafing support and uh, actual bombers are invisible so I would not like to talk about those they are probably Lancaster bombers but because I can't make sure I'm not going to talk about those uh, I am going to talk about the Horsa glider and supply base is being sent by glider to a target area. Uh, the here we get the Horsa down. glider. The it's coming in. Ah, there it is. Uh, the Horsa glider is uh, a, a glider plane which was uh, designed uh, because the British were uh, impressed with the uh, with the Fallschirmjäger, so they wanted their own parachute brigades and uh, they uh, they formed those in uh, 1941 after the fall of Crete. 
um, they they thought that uh, the parachute brigades would need uh, gliders as well uh, not only because the that would mean that uh, some parachute troops would be able to jump out of the plane that would tow the glider but then the glider itself would also contain uh, uh, about 30 parachute troops and that would mean uh, an 100% increase per plane uh, that was flying over enemy territory so um, they uh, were uh, they were going for a design of the glider uh, the glider was uh, officially called the Airspeed Horsa and there were the Airspeed 51 and the Airspeed 58 Horsa gliders and this is I assume that this is the Airspeed 58 not only because most units in Company of Heroes 2 are supposed to be late war units but also because this one seems to have the hinged front door uh, with the cockpit uh, being able to open to the side so that uh, vehicles could drive out um this one this ramp was uh, the uh, was meant to have jeeps uh being able to go in and out of the gliders sometimes gliders were reused in a uh, company of heroes they uh, always end up destroyed on the ground and um that's a bit weird because not all gliders got destroyed on impact of course um, over 3,600 of these were built and uh, apart from this uh, door here the difference between the 51 and the 58 is that the 51 was being towed by the wings and the 58 was being towed by the nose what's really interesting about this plane is that it's actually it's not a plane of course because it doesn't have an engine uh, but about this glider is that uh, the glider is uh, made entirely of wood uh, even the instruments in the cockpit were made of wood and that was all done uh, to make the weight of the glider uh, less and less. Uh, it's called Airspeed Horsa and uh, Horsa is the name of a mythical guy that was uh, uh, conquering England uh, in the Middle Ages, in the beginning of the Middle Ages. So, uh, production started in uh, 1941 and, uh, uh, like I said, the, the British were impressed by the Fallschirmjäger um, and they had seen the or heard about the taking of the fortress of Eben Emal in Belgium, which was done by glider troops. So, they were uh, also trying to uh, imitate that, just like they were imitating the paratroopers. The the cockpit had uh, plexiglass in, uh, in the windows so that if it would break on impact it would not, uh, uh, it well the chance of breaking on, on impact was uh, diminished by that and um, the, uh, the rest of the cockpit was uh, made of wood like I said and it had a communication system. In the first version the communication system was uh, connected through the towing cable with the towing plane but uh, that uh, the disadvantage of that was that the communication would break after the glider would be disconnected so uh, later the there was a wireless uh, system inside the glider so they could uh, keep communicating after it had disconnected from the uh, towing plane in uh, D-Day they were uh, used extensively uh, and not only in the initial wave but also at uh, the uh, Pegasus Bridge uh, where the uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, British troops were uh, were uh, uh, conquering the bridge so they could get to uh, th they could uh, secure the Khan Canal and another bridge over the Orna River which was then nicknamed Horsa Bridge in, uh, by some troops because of the Horsa gliders. Uh, later they were used um, in Operation Market Garden and in Operation, uh, well Operation Market Garden of course the, uh, the Battle of Arnhem, uh, the failed attempt to end the war in 1944 and they were used again in Operation Varsity 
which was the uh, uh, crossing of the Rhine in the spring of 1945. The Horsa was towed by various aircraft and it was uh, usually by four-engined uh, uh, planes such as the Short Sterling, the Handley Page Halifax, the Armstrong Whitworth Alb Alby Marley and the Armstrong Whitworth with the twin-engine bombers and um, the uh, C-47 Skytrain, the Dakota, which was a pretty uh, well-known uh, tow plane uh, did uh, do the towing mostly in Operation Market Garden. Uh, the Dakota wasn't used in other uh, operations because the glider was actually a bit too heavy for it. Okay, so uh, let's go to the last plane, which is the Typhoon. The Tactical Air Force is sending support. Right, chaps, on station over the battlefield now. Here they are, the Typhoons. The Typhoon is a, a plane that was produced by the Hawker factory. And the Hawker factory was famous for the Hurricane, the Hawker Hurricane. And the Typhoon was actually meant to be an interceptor plane uh, for high altitudes and they were uh, uh, bringing it on the field as a reply, a British reply to the Fokker Wolf that entered service in the later part of the war for Germany. Production started in 1941 and, and after the war in immediately retired. Uh, about 3,300 of these were built and um, the Typhoon uh, became the most uh, one of the most famous ground attack planes in the war. Uh, it was sometimes equipped with bombs and sometimes with rockets. And uh, the Typhoon, uh, uh, which is of course some kind of a storm, and uh, that is that was the name giving uh, habit was that the planes would get names after uh, heavy storms like hurricane. Uh, typhoon, uh, Tornado and uh, Tempest and they were all Hawker designs and um, well I just said that it was uh, like uh, 3,300 of these were built uh, that was much less than uh, other planes built like the Hurricane because of the Hurricane uh, uh, almost 15,000 were built and uh, the Supermarine Spitfire had over 20,000 of them built. So uh, the, her the Typhoon, even though it was pretty famous, was, um, was uh, much rarer than those two planes. The, uh, the Typhoon uh, uh, retired in October 1945 and uh, the piston-engined planes only played a, ro a little role in the Korean War afterwards, but uh, not the Typhoon. And uh, Hawker uh, went on to produce other aircraft. So, um, this concludes the unit video of uh, the UKF, the British Forces in Company of Heroes 2. So, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you haven't seen the other ones, please take a look. Um, so that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.